A pleasant good day to all tuning into Christ Jesus' Law Ministries. I want to welcome you back to another Bible based, power packed, um, inspirational Bible study. If you're here for the first time, I must say that you are at the right place at the right time. You will know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as contained in scripture concerning the subject which I'm teaching. And I'm not here to be any clown to entertain any goats. So if you are looking for some entertainment or amusement, I must say you are at the wrong place. This is where the Bible speaks. And we are not here to just talk, but we deal with substance. We do not deal with fiction, fables, and follow is we are not here to put on a circus and we are no clowns here so for those of you who are interested in this pop packed bible study get your bibles out call a friend call your family sit around the table and follow me closely as i study the word of god and share with you today what jesus has to say god bless you and stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. A pleasant good day to all tuning in to Christ Jesus' Lord Ministries. I want to welcome you back to another timely Bible study. One is biblical and power packed. This is the schoolroom of Christ Jesus' Lord Ministries. This is where you are edified, educated, and enlightened concerning the word of God. Today we'll be looking at a portion of Psalm 119. And that is the first portion. You need to understand that Psalm 19 is divided into 22 portions. Each portion has the heading of the Hebrew letters, the alphabet. And it is divided, as I've said, into 22 portions from Aleph to Shin. So today we'll be looking at the first portion. The Lord has laid it upon my heart to do a study on the entire chapter. So we are here today with the first aspect of Psalm 119, the first portion. And I've entitled this series Understanding the Power of the Law of God through the lenses of Psalm 119. Oftentimes, many will read this psalm. They will see the Hebrew words, depending on what version of the Bible they have. In my KDV, each one has Aleph, Beth, and it goes Gimel, Dalet, Beth, and it goes on down to Shen, the 22, uh, 22nd um, letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So we're going to see what actually Aleph is talking about. What does Aleph symbolize? What is its meaning? But before we go any further, let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your love and your mercy and your grace. I pray that you will enlighten our hearts, send your Holy Spirit to be with us, and to cover us, dear Father, to open our understanding as we study this Psalm 119. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So, as you see there on your screen, is a picture of Aleph. The pictograph, rather, of Aleph. Each letter in the Hebrew alphabet as a pictograph with a meaning. Now, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, and it means strength or leader. And the first portion of Psalm 119 is entitled Aleph from verse 1 through to verse 8. And as you can see, the ox, the head of the ox, it symbolizes strength. It denotes strength and leadership. Now, Aleph, and I'm helping you to understand some basic things concerning Aleph in the Hebrew, the classical Hebrew. And as you can see on the screen, we have the pictograph on your left. Um, you have the ox head with a staff 
And the star blue in the Hebrew is the Hebrew letter Lamed, which signifies the staff. And what the Aleph and the Lamed together means, it means strong leader. So, in Hebrew, it is Aleph, Lamed, with the vowel point under the Aleph. Now, the meaning it is the name for God, which is strength. It is used 250 times in the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament. Now, Aleph and Lamed, they are with the, with the vowel, which is the E, which is L for the name of God, which means strength or the strong one. Now, the second one there we see the pictograph of the oxy-z and the symbol for Beth, which is a house. And that there, the word picture means the strength of the house. And the Hebrew there is the Aleph and the Beth. And you have the, the vowel there in the Hebrew. And that means father. So, what we are seeing is that God the Father is the strength of the house. And that is what the Bible is telling us and if we were to go into genesis chapter 1 verse 1 we would see that it begins with the letter aleph and then after aleph comes beth and it telling us helping us to understand that god the father he is the strength of the house from him comes the strength. Let's go. So we see that in Hebrew, pictures or pictograph plays a very important part. Many do not understand by just reading the English translation that every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a meaning. It has a pictograph behind it, symbolizing something that has to do with the salvation of the souls of men, or the plan of salvation, so to speak. So let us go forward. Now, here I'm showing you on the screen Hebrew alphabet with pictographs and their meaning. And you are from Aleph Street to Tav. And the first one there is Aleph. That's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And it is the symbol of an ox, which denotes strength, leadership. And as I've shown you earlier, the Aleph plus the Lamed and the pictograph, which is that of a shepherd's staff, um, it means um, good, or the shepherd's staff, they mean good or control or towards but it means in hebrew when you put both together you get the name of god which is l so here you can have a look to see that every one of the letters has a pictograph it has meaning each pictograph has a meaning each letter as a meaning so let us go forward now aleph's composition when i'm speaking of aleph's composition i'm not just speaking about the letter i'm speaking of psalm 119 verse 1 to 8. now i want to show you and let you know that psalm 119 it is broken down into two portions from reading you can extrapolate from it that the first three verses speaks about the characteristics of a blessed man while the latter 
five verses speaks about the commitment of the blessed man and we're going to look and see what the scripture means by a blessed man when the psalmist um speaks of a blessed man there are those who will argue and speculate about the authorship of psalm 119 you would have realized in your bible there's no authorship there's no name as to who wrote it some speculate some will argue that it is david who wrote it based on how is frequent based of the frequent references of the lord the statutes and the judgment and the precepts of god but that is not what is of utmost importance as to who wrote it but what is of utmost important is what is written there in the word of god so let us go forward psalm 119 verse 1 to 8 reads blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk not who walk rather in the law of the lord blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart they also do no iniquity they walk in his ways thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently oh that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes then shall i not be ashamed when i have respect unto all thy commandments i will praise thee with uprightness of heart when i shall have learned thy righteous judgments I will keep thy statutes, O oh, forsake me not utterly. Very interesting. The characteristics of a blessed man, as I have stated, Psalm 119, 1, 2 to 3, the first portion of the psalm. And I've read it and you see it on your screen. But we have to define a number of words here so that we have a better understanding as to what the psalm is. Uh, the one who wrote this portion of the psalm or the entire psalm what he's saying blessed are the undefiled in the way who are the undefiled he's talking about he says blessed are the undefiled the word undefiled as you would check the dictionary if you were to google it whether it be the oxford the miriam webster the Collins, it will tell you that the word undefiled means one who is not defiled but that's still does not um, define it. It also means one that is not polluted. You're not contaminated. Also, one that is not vitiated. It means that one who is blameless. If you were to read it in certain um, revised version, it would say, Blessed are the blameless in the way who walk in the law of the Lord so here we settle on the definition of the word on the pile one who is not sell one who is not contaminated one who is not polluted one who is not the fire one who is clean one who is pure that is what the word on the file mean now we are going to break it down as we go along so now i'm going to give us a comprehensive understanding of what the Bible means when it says blessed because many people use words but they do not know the meaning and many people read words in the Bible but have no knowledge of what the Bible is actually saying so from the con the, the Strong's concordance here we see that the word for bless is a transliteration from the word aso which means happiness blessedness often used as an introduction and it, it it can be used in the sense that he said blessed are it is always or most times used in that regard now we need to understand that the kjb translated this word blessed 27 times the word dear asur which is translated blessed and it's also translated the same word to mean happy 18 times now we need to understand that in order for one to be happy one to experience the blessedness of god the psalmist gives us 
the prerequisite. He said, Blessed are the undefiled who walk in the law of the Lord. Now we have those who are preaching, teaching, and telling you that the law of God has been abrogated, it has been expunged, it has been erased, it has been nailed to the cross. Now, if something makes one happy, something makes one wise, because we could simply turn to Psalm 19, and I'm going to read verse 7 to us. And I could quote it from memory. It says, Blessed are rather Psalm 119 verse 1 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, hear what the psalmist now says, David, in Psalm 19 verse 7. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honey comb. Verse 11, Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. That is Psalm 19 and verse 7 through to 11. So now, the psalmist is speaking about one who is blameless. And it helps us to understand in order to be blameless, you have to walk according to the law of the Lord. Or as it is written here, who walk in the law of the Lord. So for those who are telling you that, you do not live by law. That you are to be lawless because of grace. That is contrary to scriptures. Because the psalmist already declared that the law is perfect. And if something is perfect, it is without flaw, it is without error. It is right in every aspect of its being. Then why would you, or why would God, get rid of something that is perfect? And the psalmist help us to understand that in order for you to be blameless and to live that happy life, that blessed life, you have to walk in the law of the Lord. You need to understand that everything is wrapped up. Everything revolves around the law of God. It's either you keep them and you receive the blessings according to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. And you will see the blessings which come, which is from verse 3 through to 14 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Take a time to read that portion of scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 through 14. And after you've done that, take the time to read from verse 15 through to 65, and you will see what awaits the one who refuses to keep the law of God. You will see that there are 54 verses which refer to pure curses, and you can identify them in your lives or in the lives of those who are going contrary to the law of God, who have thought to pay scant regard to the law of God, to throw them aside and to say that they have been abrogated, they have been deleted, and a Christian is not required to keep the law of God. Yet still, because they have been taught such folly, such madness, such stupidity, they think then, that they can make it to heaven and walk on streets of gold, receive golden harp, 
sing songs of Moses and the Lamb, and drink milk and honey. Now, there are many false teachers and preachers out there who are not dividing the word of God correctly. And as Jesus told the Sadducees, he said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. There are many out there who have taken unto themselves the responsibility of preaching and teaching the word of God. When God has not called them, neither has he sent them, but they run according to the Apostle Paul. But who hindered them from obeying the truth? The evil spirits that's in them. Let's go forward. He says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Now, what are his testimonies? A testimony is the spirit of prophecy. And you could see that in Revelation 19, verse 10. It is a personal revelation from God. Revealing the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A testimony comes through the Holy Ghost. It makes a deep and lasting impression on the soul. A personal revelation. God reveals himself to me. He reveals himself to many others. By sending his spirit of truth to lead and to guide us in the path of righteousness. And by doing so, he reveals the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That I am a sinner and that I need a savior. And that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And that by believing in him, whosoever will not perish, they will not be damned and cast into that lake of fire. But they will have eternal life. They will receive life from Christ. As Second Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says, Michael the archangel will come with the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive will be caught up together. That is when you will be transformed in the twinkle of eye. You will receive a glorified body. And you will receive eternal life. No. There is someone out there who think that mere water baptism, jumping up and down, prancing all over the place, swinging on the chandeliers, some assaulting in the aisles, that that is what makes them blameless. But it's a blessed are they that keep his testimony. Keep the word of God. The word of the Lord are sure words. A silver purified in a fiery furnace purified seven times. So what the psalmist here again is helping to understand is that the word of God is without corruption. There is nothing in the word of God that will lead a man astray from the path of righteousness. Only the evil spirits of Satan, Satanas, who will lead a man from the righteousness of Christ, from his testimony, from the truthfulness of the gospel, for them to believe all manner of heresy, thinking that doing everything that is contrary to the word of God, not studying the word of God for themselves, but allow some men who filled with hypocrisy Speaking lies in hypocrisy because they have had their conscience seared with a hot iron, as Paul says. Believe in doctrines of devils. Just remember, a testimony comes through the Holy Ghost. It makes a deep and lasting impression. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, as Jesus says in John chapter 14, John chapter 16, when the spirit of truth is come, he will lead and guide you into all truth. No man can lead and guide you into all truth except the Holy Spirit. 
Now there are those who think that the Holy Spirit is a force and that they just can control the Holy Spirit at will and do what they, 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 they desire. They can, they can subdue Him and they can command Him to speak, to act, to work miracles, to cast out devils, to do all manner of things at their disposal. And that the Holy Spirit is at their disposal to use however and whenever they want. But it's not so. Just recently, a day ago, someone asked me, where in the Bible does the Bible refer to the Holy Spirit as a person? Many do not see the Holy Spirit as a personal being. They see him as some force. Some say he's the essence of God. But they know in scripture that the Bible refers to God, the Holy Spirit, as the essence of God. I have done several studies on the Holy Spirit, showing from the scriptures and from the Hebrew scriptures, where in the Bible speaks of God, the Holy Spirit as God. The New Testament, where God, Jesus, and in the apostles refer to the Holy Spirit as God. Scripture is replete with inferences, which talks about the Holy Spirit, tells you of his ministry. It does not, does not give you personal detail as to who he is, but Christ tells us what his function and what his role is when it comes to the plan of salvation for the saving of humanity, men's soul. So, where the Bible is silent on the Holy Spirit, I will remain silent. But what the Bible teaches, I will teach and I will hammer it home until many get it in their thick skull and in their brain and see what the Bible has revealed and what the Bible teaches. Because there are many running after fables and fallacies and not knowing that the Bible says the law of God is perfect converting the soul and that the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. Now, you see what the testimonies of God is. Revealing. It's a personal revelation from God. Many do not have any revelation. They do not have any revelation. Many are only reveling in a situation that is diabolic. Many are part of faith groups that are being led by the demonic. Not from God. They receive revelation. But the revelation that they receive are from demons and devils. And there is no truthfulness in that which they are talking about. They seldom make mention of the name Jesus Christ. And what they are putting forth is not the gospel, but gospels that they are casting and putting upon the people in their pews. Those people are under spells. Testimony comes through the Holy Spirit and not these pseudo prophets and apostles. And when the testimony come through the Holy Spirit, it will make a deep and lasting impression on the soul. Let's go forth. A testimony, I'm giving you a breakdown from the Webster's, uh, not the Webster's, the Strong's Concordant, which tells you what a testimony is. The testimony is known. Testimonies, it's plural, and it's a solemn declaration usually made orally by a witness under oath in response to interrogation by a lawyer or authorized public official. That's the first definition. B, first an authentication of fact. So evidence, it's an outward sign. It's an open acknowledgement. It's a public profession of religious experience. And then it goes on to say that the tablets inscribed with the Mosaic Law is referring to the Ten um, Commandments here. And it says the Ark containing the tablets is speaking about the Ark of the Covenant where Moses 
replace the Ten Commandments of stone that, 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 that God has written the commandments with the fingers of his hand and placed them into the ark it's to show their prominence and their everlasting um, to show that they will be required to be kept for all eternity and it tells you it is a divine divine decree attested in the scriptures so the bible tells us in revelation chapter 12 that we overcame that the saints overcame by their testimonies now the bible in psalm 2 says that blessed are they that keep his testimonies not your testimony but the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. And Revelation tells us that, what it is. Now, let's look at Psalm 119, verse 3. The Bible says, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. They do no iniquity. Now, let us look at what iniquity is. And in depth, look at the meaning of the word iniquity. It comes from the word one and it's a masculine known and in the King James Version translation there's a count of up to 230 times that this word is used iniquity what is iniquity by the way iniquity it is used to mean punishment 220 times now iniquity the word they are one rather it is used 220 times meaning iniquity it is also used five times to mean punishment two times meaning fault and iniquities it may use as one time and it is used as sin one time now that this still does not give you an understanding as to what iniquity is so let's go now the biblical usage of the word iniquity means perversity depravity iniquity guilt or punishment of iniquity it is iniquity it is guilt of iniquity guilt as great guilt of condition consequence of our punishment for iniquity so we see that the word perversity it says for example moral evil and we know that the ten commandments is the moral law and it is what should govern our moral life or moral being it is fault it's iniquity mischief sin So when we speak of iniquity, we're speaking of a man, woman, boy, were committing an act, and they continuously and repetitively do that evil, moral evil, without any consideration for repentance or turning away from such evil that is iniquity so once a man might find himself committing an act wherein he steals something which is sin but the man who gets up every day and makes stealing his full-time job in the sight of god it is considered to be iniquity that's an example i'm giving you so it is perversity it is depravity so that, that person is perverse in their mind that person is depraved that's what it speaks of iniquity depravity extreme iniquity and perversity wickedness evil now psalm 68 verse 18 says and i have it in red here it says if i regard iniquity in my heart the Lord will not hear me. 
So there are many who have been praying. There are many who have been calling upon God. Many who have been fasting. They have been going to their prayer mountains. They have been going to their hills. They have been going to their secret closets and in their rooms. They have been going to all manner of different places, altars in the church, to their prophets, to their priests and even to their teachers and evangelists and their apostles. But God is not hearing their prayers. Why? Because they regard iniquity in their heart, evil, depravity, perverseness, wickedness, and they have not repented of it. And the Bible tells us that God will not hear our prayers. Though we make many prayers and supplication, He will not hear us. That's what the Bible says. Now let's look at Proverbs chapter 15, parallel Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29, which is a parallel scripture to Psalm 66 and verse 18. It says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. So the Lord Yahweh, who is the strong leader, he is far from the wicked. He doesn't want anything to do with the wicked. But he hears the prayer of the righteous. So if you are dabbling in witchcraft, voodoo, occult, whatever evil you're practicing, you're breaking God's commandments. And then you come saying that you're calling upon him. He will not hear your prayer. But he is the prayer of the righteous. The prayer of the righteous. Who is the righteous? They who are obedient to the word of God. They who live according to God's statutes, his, his laws, his precepts, his commandments. That is what the Bible says. So, you need to understand that there are only two kinds of people on this earth. Either you are wicked or you are righteous. You don't have to go outside there with a shotgun and shooting people or with bombs and blowing up people like the people who are of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. No, as long as you are not living according to the word of God. It doesn't matter what people might say that, oh, you are an upstanding citizen or a member of the community. That does not make you righteous in the sight of God. What makes you righteous in the sight of God is that you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You turn away from your wicked ways. You baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to show the world the symbol that you are no longer walking according to the devices of the world and doing the things of the world. But now you have made a turn about and you're going to go the way of the Lord. And the Bible, the word of God is going to be your rule of life. So you're going to be obedient to the word of God and live according to the word of God. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 9 is another um, parallel text to Psalm 66 verse 18. He said, he that turned it away his ear from hearing the law even his prayer shall be an abomination you see this comes right back to Psalm 119 verse 1 Aleph which he says that blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord so one of the prerequisites or I should say the prerequisite to have your prayer being heard by God is that you do not turn your ear away from hearing the law because your prayer is going to be an abomination it means that God turns his back on it he doesn't want to hear it he stops his ear from hearing it and we know that God's ear is not heavy and I read that for you from the book of Isaiah and we go into Isaiah chapter 50, 
9. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is he heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perverseness. Oh my, my. So you see, the law of the Lord tells you how you are to operate. It tells you that you must love your neighbor as yourself, and love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now if you do that, you will have no time to shed blood. You will have no time to have your fingers with iniquity. Your lips will not have time to speak lies. Your tongue will not have any time or place to mutter perverseness. God's ear is not heavy. It is not weary that it cannot hear. It says your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. How many of us are praying long prayers, day in, day out? How many of us are fasting, yet we are not seeing any breakthrough? You need to check yourself, do some introspection, and see if you are being obedient to the word of God, and you are walking according to the law of God. Because the truth is, it doesn't matter what you want to say. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. No, if the law of God is what converts my soul, why would God do away with it? When I'm a sinner in need of conversion, my soul needs to be converted unto righteousness in order for me to keep his law, his statutes, his commandments, and his precepts. So somebody is lying. Whoever is telling you that you do not need to keep the law of God, consider such a person to be an antinomian. The word antinomian comes from the word anti, which means against, and the Greek word nomos, which means law. So that person is against the law. That person is a lawless being, and you cannot have a lawless being as your teacher, as your apostle, as your prophet, or as your pastor, which is telling you that Jesus done away with the law, he nailed it to the cross, and he has trampled it on their feet, or throw it out, so that we can trample it on their feet, and yet still be saved. That is foolishness, madness, total heresy. And that's coming from the lips of heretics. Let's go forward. Now, what are the results of iniquity in your life? Let us see. Let us continue with a parallel text from Isaiah chapter 66, verse 80. Isaiah chapter from rather Psalm 66 and verse 18. Now, a parallel text. And it tells you the result of iniquity in your life. He said, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your, you. I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So this is the result of iniquity. He said, When you spread forth your hands, when you lift up your hand toward the sky, and say you lift your up only hands to God. He said, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many pearls, you're on your knees for the whole night. You go to your vigils, and you go on your prayer mountains. The Bible says your hands are full of blood. The Bible says he who hates his brother is a murderer. And you don't have to take a shotgun or a machete to shoot someone or chop them up respectively. You don't have to poison someone. You don't have to butcher them, you don't have to pay someone to destroy them or delete them from this earth. But the Bible says from once there is hatred in your evil heart towards a fellow man, a brother or sister, even your very enemies. The Bible says you prayers will not be heard by God. 
and will hide his eyes from you. So you are left up to the devices of the devil, to his mercies. And we know he's not merciful, but rather he's merciless. So he will have a ball, a field day with you. And ultimately, he's going to destroy you. Now, John 9, 31 says, Now we know that God is not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he will hear. Now, the man who was healed by Jesus, God spat, made clay, put it on his eyes, told him to go wash in the pool, Salome, Salome. And when he received his sight and was happy, now they took him to the temple and wanted to know how he got his sight. Now the man told them what happened. And the man, when they tried to cross question him, wanting him to deny Christ, that Christ was the one who healed him. He said this. Now we know that God here not sinners for. Not sinners. What is the man saying here? The one who continuously practice sin. The one who lives a vagabond life it is like what the Old Testament, the New Testament consider to be a publican. A publican in the Jewish setting was one who was a Jew or an Israelite. He knows that he should not be living a certain lifestyle. Yet still, he pursue such a life. Now the Bible says, what the man is understand that you who are bent in going contrary to the law of God are not living a blameless life, a blessed life. You cannot be happy because God will not hear you. For example, the men who were at Gadara and they were raising pigs. Now you know that the Jews did not deal with pigs. They did not raise them, neither ate them. Because the Bible says they were unclean. They were an abomination. Leviticus chapter 11. So pig wasn't a part or pork a part of the dietary um, food for the Jews. But yet still, these men were out in the backwoods with over 2,000 swines raising them, doing some illegal business. And as a result, their business was destroyed because the demons asked that they enter into touch abominable animals and they ran over the precipice and they drowned. But we need to understand, it did not stop there to say that God does not hear it, sinners. They who are living a life of perversity, an object evil, and who are not just mere sinners, but sinisters. And they, they do not have any regard for God's law, His commandments, His statutes, and His principles. He said, but... Notice this erase that which was said. No, we're not dealing with those who are sinners, who oppose the law of God, who do not want anything to do with obedience, but who are rebels and rebellious individuals. He says, but cancels out that. If any man be a worshiper of God, and if is a subjunctive means that it's based on choice. If any man be a worshiper of God and do it his will, him he hear it. So we see that the scripture here helps us to understand that if you are a worshiper of God and do it his will, God will hear you. And that there's no doubt about that. What does I mean? To, that you are a worshiper of God, as the man here is saying. He's not speaking about you going in the cathedral, going into the synagogue, going into a building on Sunday, Saturday, or whichever day of the week, 
and sing some hymns, sing some praise and worship songs, hear somebody from the lectern or the pulpit um, speak some word by distorting the word of God or uh, what Whatever they may choose to do, give some fanciful um, talk or stories or speak such things that has nothing to do with the word of God. But let's go over to John chapter 4 verse 24. Where Jesus told the woman at the well, God is a spirit. They who worship him must worship him in spirit and the truth for the Father seeketh such. It says the time will come when you will not worship in the mountain of Samaria or at Jerusalem. But God is a spirit. They who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Obedience to the law of God. Obedience to the word of God. Not your will, but God's will. Re uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Paul helps us to one. He said, be transformed in the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove that which is the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Is when you are transformed. And how do you be transformed? Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So when the mind of Christ is in you, you are transformed. And you will able to know that which is the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Anyone who do it is will. God will lead you into all truth. His Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. John chapter 16 and chapter 14 helps us to understand that. The Spirit of truth comes. He will lead and guide us into all truth. Now, James chapter 4 verse 3 says, You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss. You ask with doubt that you may consume it upon your loss, because you are committing sin. You are lustful. Your appetite is contrary to the word of God. You ask, you receive not, because you ask amiss. Psalm chapter 119 verse 4 and 5 says, Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. What are precepts? When he says, oh, that my, com I, I, oh, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Underscore the word diligently. So you got to make a concerted effort to do it. It does not happen like that. You have the purpose in your heart. You got to practice. You're going to make it your daily requirement to keep it. Now, precepts. In a general sense, any commandment or order intended as an authoritative rule of action but apply particularly to commands respecting moral conduct. The Ten Commandments are so many precepts for the regulation of our moral conduct. So when he speaks of precepts, he's still speaking of the commandments of God. The words are used interchangeably if we were would have noticed and were following um, the study carefully and that if we should go and do our investigation and seek the meaning of them as from the Hebrew root which they come from which it comes from rather so precepts and commands are one and the same but to break it down it applies to the commandments which respect moral conduct. And we know that the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God, Exodus chapter 20, is called the moral law. It is referred to as the moral code of conduct. 
tells us how our relationship to our fellow men and also to God. Secondly, in law, it's a command or mandate in writing. So, God's commands. What are His commands? Read the Bible and you will see. All that He says we should do and that we should not do. So, He says God has commanded us to keep His precepts. So, how is that you wish to be happy? Yet still, you disobey God's commandments. How do you expect to live the good life and to receive His many blessings? That are in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 through the 14. Without doing the prerequisites. Which is to keep his precepts, keep his commandments, his statutes, his word, his judgments. I don't know. Maybe you know. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. That's an exclamation that the psalmist made. What the psalmist is helping to understand that because of the sinful nature, his ways are not directed to keep God's statutes freely. Therefore, verse 4 says, Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently so that's where the diligently comes in because his ways are not directed to keep god's laws his commandments his studs or just simply say his commandments because of the inherited nature from adam and eve that sinful nature wherein it is easy for a man to do that which is immoral and everything that is contrary to the word of god to the law of god it says, God has commanded that we should keep his precepts diligently. So we should make the deliberate effort. We should purpose to do it. And we should strive to do it. And we should practice to do it daily. That's what he's saying here. Your ways and my ways are not directed to keep the statutes of the Lord. Let's look at the meaning of the word statutes. And I take it to you from the Hebrew English Dictionary dealing with Strong's Concordance. Um, the word statutes comes from the, the word Hebrew, picod. And in Bible usage, it means commandment, precept, likewise, statutes. So what I'm showing you that these words are used interchangeably and leave a comment if you think that I have it wrong we are seeing that the words are used interchangeably they refer to the same things though they be different they refer to the same thing all points or, or should I say every one of them points to the commandments of God Strong definition, properly appointed, that is a mandate of God, plural only, collectively for the law. So when it speaks here about statute, it's speaking, referring to the Ten Commandments, wherein collectively there are Ten Commandments. Yet, the Ten Commandments make up one law, the moral law, which is the Decalogue, which is the royal law. And we see other the, the, the persons who define the word statute there, like Brown Driver and Briggs definition. Uh, Brown Driver, Briggs definition, it means precept, statute. And I have used the word precept before in, in, in the text um, portion of scripture. And it says the translation occurrences, it means commandments twice precept 19 times statutes one so this is how the word is used so that we have an understanding when we come across the word precept laws um, statutes judgment they are all referring to the commandments the law of god 
Um, let's look at Psalm 119 and verse 7 to 8. He said, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. I will keep thy statutes, O forsake me not utterly. What does it mean by uprightness of heart? To be upright, or the word uprightness, it means to be upright, it means to be honest, it means to be just, conscientious, scrupulous, honorable, mean, having or showing a strict regard for what is morally right. Upright implies a strict adherence to moral principle. So, one who is upright is one who adheres to the moral code of conduct as stipulated by the moral law, God's commandment. It's all about obedience, so one who is obedient. No, you cannot be disobedient, disobeying the word of God, doing as you please and expect that you are to um, get the benefits of the upright when you are not being upright, when you are being unscrupulous and dishonorable and dishonest and unjust towards God's principles, his government. Likewise, the Psalm that says that he will praise him with uprightness of heart. A man who is wicked and evil, sinister, and goes contrary to the word of God, and does everything contrary to God's word, it's impossible for him to praise the Lord with uprightness of heart. In fact, he will not even praise the Lord. Because he doesn't love the Lord. Because if he had loved the Lord, he would have been adhering to the moral principles, which is the code of one's conduct, or ought to be the code of a man's conduct here on this earth, because uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the latter two verses says, let us hear the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, because this is the whole duty of man. This is not for you to chase after the houses, the cars, the women, the men, the money, the vacations, the degrees are that which is the material. When you are obey to God, obedient rather to God, all these things will come. Because the Bible te teaches in Psalm, no good thing will you withhold from them that walk uprightly. So if you are walking uprightly, God will not withhold anything good from you. And God knows what you are in need of. The house, the car, the wife, the husband, the degrees, the vacations, the, the health, the happiness, the cause, whatever that is to make you live and live a comfortable life on this sin curse earth as you progress towards um, you know, towards uh, rather you progress on your pilgrim journey. Um, towards your destination, which is the earth made new, which is to heaven to spend a thousand years with Christ when he shall return again. God will not withhold anything that is for your good. Anyone who tells you that is a liar. No, the psalmist says he will praise God when he would have learned of his righteous judgment. What are his righteous judgment? That are the judgment based on the principles of righteousness. So when the psalmist learned that, listen me man, this is what's going to happen to you if you go contrary to the word of God. And this is how you're going to be judged. This is what will befall you. Because it has been stated that and stipulated, written down, the curses and the blessings that if you do this, you will receive this. If you don't do this, you will receive this. Take for example, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1 through to 14. Verses 1 and 2 tells us if we keep God's commandment and hearken unto his voice diligently. Verse 3 through to verse 14, we will experience in our life. Then verse 15 tells us if we fail to 
hearken unto the commandments of the Lord our God. Then verse 16 through to verse 65 will come upon our lives. And many people today, and I'm speaking about in the church, they who call themselves um, children of God, they who say that they are of the household of faith, and they are Christians, and we can look into their life and place them right beside Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through to 68, and we will see what jumps out at us and we will see whether or not it is blessing or cursing that they are experienced in their life and based on what we are seeing evident in their life we can let the word of god judge them because if they were experiencing uh due to my chapter 28 1 through to 14 in their life that will be evident but if it's Verse 15 through to 65, then that also will be evident. And based on that, we can make our conclusion. Now, I want us to understand that Aleph, which is the first um, letter in the Hebrew alphabet, it has a meaning. It has a pictograph, which is the ox's head which shows you and tells you that it is the strength of the ox. And also, it's a leader. We know that God is the one who leads us. He leads us into the path of righteousness for his name's sake, as the psalmist says in Psalm 23. Now only does he lead us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, but he is the strong one because he is strong we need not fear he will help us in our time of weakness because he is strong he tells us that the bible tells us that he gives um strength to the one who is weak and we can see that in the book of isaiah chapter uh chapter in the 40th chapter yes it says isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 and we will close with this portion he said as thou not known as thou not heard that the everlasting god the lord the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not neither is weary there is no searching of his understanding. Notice there, faint it not. Neither is he weary. He cannot be um, drained of his strength. He cannot become weak because it says he is not weary. One who is weary is without strength. One who fainteth lacks strength also. He said he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases strength because he is the strong one el Rohi, the strong one who sees he is the one who is able to give strength to the weak and to they who have no might and to power also power to the faint. He says, In the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. No, if God is the strength, is the leader of the house, Aleph, how can he be weary? How can he lack strength? It's impossible. He says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So, young man is more of the definition of strength, vigor, and vitality. When a man is young, he has strength, he is robust, he has muscles. An old man is declining, going towards the end of his journey, um, having his grave in sight, if you would allow me to use that analogy. No, but a young man in the prime of his life is a representation of strength. Uh, but the Bible tells you that even the youth, the young men, 
shall faint and be weary and not only that but they will stumble and utterly fall but god cannot fall he cannot stumble he cannot be weary he cannot faint because he's a strong one and he's the strength of the house but they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint now the only way you can experience this isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 the experience the strength of god is for you to wait upon the lord then you will mount up with wings like eagle you shall have renewed strength and you will run and not be weary and you will walk and not faint remember in time of your weakness remember that god the father is the strength of the house he's the strong one who sees never you forget that if you're weak he has strength if you have enemies who are stronger than you remember that he is the strength of the house and that he never faints he's never weary and can never fall and because of that you are able to praise god with uprightness of heart when you have learned of his righteous judgment because righteous judgments are those based on the principles of righteousness. And when God judges you, it's based on the principles of righteousness, his word, which he has given us as our guide. So if we be obedient to his word, we have nothing to fear. And we can say, as the psalm is declared at the latter part of verse 8 in Psalm 119, Oh, forsake me not utterly. So we see the importance of the law looking through the lenses of psalm 119 and the first letter which is aleph which it tells us that blessed are the undefiled in the way of the lord who walk in the law of the lord and when you walk in the law of the lord then the bible tells you that you will do no iniquity and you will walk in his ways may god bless you may god keep you and may god sh sh um, shine his light upon you may he grant unto you strength for those of you who are weak may he help you to dwell in his house and lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake have a good day those of you who want to subscribe hit the subscription button for all those of you who are my viewers and subscribers i'm asking you to leave a comment and leave a like for the study and let me know what are your thoughts i bless you all in jesus name let us pray father be with all those who tune in to this study I pray that you will bless and keep them. Help them to understand that you are the strength of the house and you are the strong one who sees. I pray, dear Father, that you will continue to lead God and direct us and may our hearts find um, the place, dear God, to receive your words. And as the psalmist says, thy word of I hid in thy, my heart that I might not sin against thee. Help us to hide your words in our heart so that we'll be able to walk in the law of the lord in jesus holy and precious name i pray amen now i bless you all until the next upload i pray that you will share these um timely bible studies and that you will seek to share the word of god with those around you and i just want to know for those of you in your weakness that god has strength that you just need to tap into and that no one can drain have a good day be blessed